and welcome back to the Cover 3 podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at youtube.com slash cover3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 tailgate. Of course, here on a Thursday, we are going to be talking to the Cover 3 tailgate often as this is a mailbag episode, live audience. We're going to be taking questions all throughout the show. And for those of you that have been jumping into the big old bag of mail, leaving us a five-star review and putting your question in that review, we'll get to some of those as well. Uh, Among the questions we're looking to get to today from the big old bag of mail, uh, some quarterbacks that maybe no one is talking about and could surprise fans this year. And... You know, on the emotional side, we are building a new college football. What are three things about college football that the three of us would protect at all costs? We'll get into all that and so much more. But we begin with uh, one of the topics that has been rolling throughout the Cover 3 tailgate since we went live. Uh, It has to do with the proposals that has been, you know, leaked out from all of our, our, our great places. You know, the term they are using is we are socializing this plan. And the plan that they are socializing is a 14-team college football playoff model. It is one that would have three guaranteed bids for the Big Ten. It would have three guaranteed bids for the SEC. It would have two guaranteed bids for the ACC. It would have two guaranteed bids for the Big 12, one for the highest-rated Group of Five conference, and three at-large bids. Tom... It sounds a little Champions League-y. I, I mean, well, what's your general read on something? They say they are socializing it, a.k.a. Le- leaking it out, letting us all react to it, and then seeing what the reaction is. What is your reaction to the proposed 14-team format with multiple automatic bids for the four-power conference and an extra one for the Big Ten and the SEC? Just amazed how it's always ESPN who somehow gets it first. It's just, I don't know, Pete and Heather. Hey, shout out to Ross. Ross is a big fan of the Cover 3 podcast. I saw it first over at Yahoo, you know, like Ross, Pete, Heather. I mean, all of Did Ross have it first? I don't know. I, I, mean, it's, I, it's, I saw it from Pete and Heather. I don't know. Um, I, I think it's, it's probably a group text. It's Bill Hancock and then all of them. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, ready on your mark. Get go. set. <laughs> go. Sweetie, which was, uh, what was the news the other day? Something happened. Uh, the team announced something and they included a photo of the player and then Schefter tweeted the news himself, but he literally stole the photo from the team tweet announcing it and put it in his tweet. I'm like, bro, just, just retweet it. Anyway. Um, as for my initial reaction to this, I, I'm done being mad about it. I just find it funny now that there's going to be pushback on this from all the people who have been crying how they wanted 12 teams for years or expanded playoff. And now that we're going to add a couple more teams and there's going to be these weird qualifiers, you're going to see a bunch of people bitching about it. I think it's funny. I do think what will be really funny is with the way that this is set up with the automatic qualifiers, like the big 10 and the SEC automatically getting three and the big 12 and the ACC while they're still alive, getting two. I can't wait until the first season where like the second best team in the ACC is an eight and four, you know, like Louisville, like last year, a, a, a decent team, but not what you would consider a playoff team. And then they get like the bid because they're second place in the ACC over like a nine and three Oklahoma in the SEC or something that will quickly put an end to the ACC and the big 12 getting two bids. So for now, whatever, they're just floating it. There is no good. There is no good answer for any of these things. So whatever, I don't care. (laughs) Um, they were, uh, 10 and two, right? The Cardinals. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a represent. Now, who cares? And who knows how they would have fared in the playoffs itself, but it wasn't that bad. But could there be clearly that could happen? We talked about this the other day, like pitched it around there. I think so. I'm trying to see, like, because I I love it. The three, three, two, two, one model. Let's go. <laughs> like I just was starting to into that. Um 33, 32, one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The socializing term is just, I don't know what we're doing with that. It is, it's annoying. I think Sankey was the first one I heard say that, right? Yeah. I wonder how much time went into that, like thinking about the verbiage of how we're going to use this. Um, Cause they don't want you to get too excited. So they don't pull that rug out from under you again, like they did with the 12 team by delaying it another couple years. I actually like it. 
Um, but I think Tom is right. There is going to be complaining, of course, after there's a second place team that gets in. But my point was like, at least, if, and I think, don't you think the big winners are the ACC and the Big 12? Yes. yes. Because they're going to be guaranteed the spots. And I think maybe the biggest winner of all is the Big 12. I mean, Bud's pointed out here a lot because I proposed these, you know, we had this conversation uh, previously. Bud's been like, well, that's a bad deal for the ACC. They, they have more championship contenders than the Big 12 does. And I would agree with that right now as it's currently constituted. Um, but at least like if you're going to get screwed, which you are, if you're the ACC and Big 12, you are not viewed the same. At least you know how you're getting screwed. All right, you guys are getting three. Probably going to be making good case for those extra three at large, but at least we get our two and maybe some years we can really pound the table for our own third. I think good. And especially the huge winners in this are the ACs or is the ACC if Florida State and Clemson leave. But who the heck knows like how things mix up. But if that happens and the AC sales survives with as viewed as a power four, then they're the huge, they're the best winner, biggest winner of all. Yeah, the ACC loses those championship contending teams and the ACC looks just like the Big 12, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and if the ACC believes that, again, this format would not begin until 2026, if you believe in 2026, you're not going to have Florida State and you might not have others, you know, uh, whether it's a Clemson or whether it's a Miami, then, yeah, I, I do think you sign up for it. Uh, conference I, championship weekend probably doesn't matter anymore, right? No, no. Speaking, Yeah, because if you saw there was a, if you did the new format based on last year's results, the first round matchup would have been Florida State and Louisville. Boy, how else would we have seen that game? I mean, it, so it would have been back to back weeks in the ACC title game that that game that was so good that ESPN was on the air lobbying to keep those damn Seminoles out of the playoffs. So we didn't have to watch that crap again. But it would have been a first round matchup. You know, I want to off the committee, right? I just want to do away with them that's where they could step in and manipulate it so that you mm -hmm. wouldn't have to see that matchup again. So I think that's the good part of having a committee that could manipulate things so you didn't have to see that again. But you also would have had a first round game between Ohio State and Penn State, which oh thank God we could finally see that matchup because we all remember how great that game was during the regular season. It's I think going to the like the Big 12 and the ACC getting the two bids, I'm guessing Whereas it's like we're calling them the big winners. I'm guessing where they'll lose is what the SEC and Big Ten get in revenue share by saying, yes. you know what, we'll give you the second team, but we want an extra 10%. Yeah. So the, it's like you can be, be viable, but we're going to make more money. And then we're also going to get the at larges too. So the group of five in the initial college football playoff system signed up for a deal where they got money, understanding they would not get much access it is possible that this is the trade that we are seeing where the ACC and the Big 12 in an effort to maintain access and a seat at the table are going to be willing to give up some revenue considerations to the two biggest conferences, the ones who have the properties that are going to drive the value on this new television deal. Um, an interesting position for the ACC, but again, you look into your crystal ball and you start to think about what the makeup of the conference is going to be moving forward. If you are pit. If you are Louisville, you know, if you are Virginia Tech, this would be a reason why even if Florida State is, is going to get privately financed hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to buy their rights back from the ACC, that if you are one of those other teams, maybe your calculus is, okay, let's hang here as long as the ACC has these guaranteed spots in the college football playoff. It would be a win for the Atlantic Coast Conference in terms of it just not getting pac 12 out here you know, moving forward, that if you've got that written in, then you at least have a chance or a reason to be able to convince the rest of the conference to try to stick around moving forward. Um, how about this one? Uh, good, good point. Wanted to bring it up anyway, but, you know, Jerry in the tailgate want to highlight you. Thank you for coming and hanging out before the show. I can't imagine Notre Dame likes the three, three, two, two, one hike 14 team playoff. Only three at large spots. Good. Don't like it. Sack up and join a conference then if you don't like it. I am I imagine it, that this is that if Notre Dame agrees to this, that's a that's a tell. No, I isn't the situation that they'll just get an automatic at large if they're in the top 14? Yeah, yeah, they'll be fine. So they'll be fine, yeah. Won't change anything for them. They'll still get the same sweet deal as long as they go nine and three, they'll be in the playoff with a bye. Yeah. Because they want to play a championship game. Seven, 
seven at larges versus three at larges. I I do imagine that Notre Dame is probably not a winner. They might still be okay with a low bar for entry, but I'm 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 gonna stick with my. I think I think it might be a tell of where things might be headed uh, moving forward. But we'll see on that. Um, any anything else from the fourteen team format that stands out? I saw some people pointing out in the chat, like, and I, I severe. I, I think conference championship games have to go away. You know, like we were talking. I, I just think if, I don't know how they survive. I think they'll survive the next two years. But when you start looking at these different playoff models, it's just it doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, I don't want to go. Before. I'm not ready to go down the line of like, well, how are you going to seed it? Because right. that also gets confusing. Like, is it going to be? Or are we to avoid rematches? Going to be like, all right, and in this little bracket, it'll be SEC two versus Big Twelve one in this little bracket, and then we we fill ourselves in. Are the conference offices going to be responsible for deciding who gets the three bids, um, or is the selection committee going to be ranking these teams against each other as well? I all of that stuff is very um, murky, and I don't feel comfortable taking a hard stance one way or the other. But it could get very messy with the ability to make wrong decisions. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, like there's been some people have argued that in the 12 team system that we're going to have here for the next couple of years, there's actually an advantage to being fifth instead yes. of fourth, because yeah, you don't get the buy, but you get to play whoever the G five team will be. And then you get, you know, in this, in the 33, 22, 11 hut, we get like, there's an argument if you keep conference championship games, it's better to finish third in your conference than second. Because if the rankings aren't done until after the conference championship game, odds are the loser of the conference championship game will fall down below you and you'll move up a spot without having even played. So like that will matter in both the Big Ten, SEC, ACC, and Big 12. It would matter for all of them. So you'd, you'd be better off not playing in that game and being in third place. What I am also not sure back into the like wonkiness of seeding, even in this 12-team format, would the five twelve play into the four, or would the five twelve play into? They the would one? play into the four if the five would go to the four. Yeah, five is way better. Yeah. So then your your first opponent is going to be the group of five conference champion more than likely, and you're going to host that game on your campus or at a spot that you designate. Then mm-hmm. your quarterfinal matchup is going to be at the lowest ranked of the four teams that got an automatic buy, which means you're playing the conference champion likely from the ACC or the big 12. And then all of a sudden, boom, like that's way better than anything that you would get in terms of um, having to play any of the SEC or big 10 teams along the way. Yeah. Five seed is a uh, five seeds. Is certainly in an advantageous position. Lots more uh, for lots more for us to be able to, to get our hands around again, Notre Dame, could end up being that five seed. So they might end up being a a team that benefits a lot from that. Also this week, we got some news out of Lawrence, Kansas, as Lance Leipold is going to get himself a well-deserved raise uh, in in a new contract along the way. Uh, Lance Leipold, you know, was a name that we mentioned for basically any coaching job where you need someone to come in and just reestablish everything from the foundation and build it up because that's what he's been able to do at Kansas. Tom, over under three and a half more seasons, Lance Leipold <laughs> is at Kansas. Over. Over. Go Jay. He wants to be there. I think that's where he wants to be. And I think that in this new Big 12, they've got a chance to be really good. Like they've got a chance to be the way that the program has been built up the last few years, the direction it's heading, Oklahoma and Texas leaving, kind of a wide open path. They've got a chance to suddenly be one of the top teams in that conference. And I think if that's happening, yeah, teams are going to still keep coming for him and maybe one of the power two teams prime him away, but I don't think so. I think he could have had one of those jobs already if he wanted them and he didn't take them. Uh, what was the, how was the timeline? How many years? Three and a half. I think, it's, I think it's close, but I do think I, I think he stays. I mean, he said he's been on record saying I'm Kansas for life, right? But we've heard that before. I do think he means it. I think he desires it, but I think a lot of it has to do with the landscape, like what happens with the future. Do you think this deal was negotiated now, or do you think we're just hearing about it? I think it's been negotiated for a while, and they're just kind of announcing it now. Same. 
And I also thought it was interesting that not only was his pay increased, but the salary pool for the assistants was increased because After one of the biggest coordinator day. hires we've talked about was Andy yeah. Colton going from Kansas to Penn State. So I do think like in the in the aftermath of the coaching carousel where he was in the mix for a lot of jobs and was a top choice and his name was brought up there oftentimes by us, I think that had to come into it. But I also think he's like, hey, if you want me to stay here, I need to be able to keep my assistance. And we lost a really good one. And I want to be able to keep these. So I think from that perspective, like it is, you know, the headlines read, this is a sign of Kansas's commitment along with the $450 million they're pouring into the athletic program. So I, I believe them when they say that. But I think it's like well-deserved. This is one that makes a lot of sense. Kansas, again, a uh, massive stadium renovation project going to be going on. They will be playing their home games elsewhere, including a few at Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. Um, so it, it'll be a, a transition year. Travis Kelsey, Taylor Swift, Kansas City Chiefs, Arrowhead Stadium. Put it on the transcript. Uh, yeah, so you he realize they have better odds to make the college football playoff. I was looking at these the other day. Then like USC, like there's some blue bloods in there. I think LSU maybe like they have better odds just to make the 12 team playoff because they're in the big 12. They have better odds to make it and get there than a lot of programs. And just three years ago, but we would have been like, or is this a joke? Like he right. did bring it from the depths of despair. I mean, this program was completely toast after Les Miles was gone. And when he took it over after spring football, like it was pretty wild to see him turn around as quickly as he has. Great point. Two and 10 in year one, six and seven year two, getting them back to the bowl game for the first time in a while. Then last year, breakthrough nine and four, winning conference record in a bowl win that gets them into the top 25 of the final rankings, 17 and 21 overall. So, I mean, you know, if we're going to continue to project this, that's cl clearly going to turn around moving into the future. He is also 59 years old. So, how much longer are you going to stick around? You got this new pay raise. He says he's Kansas for life. Uh, he he very well might be. Coming up on that the other side. That sounds like the worst rap album of all time. <laughs> what? Kansas for Kansas life. Kansas for life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 mean, where's Dennis? Actually, that's Dennis Dodd's album. Yes. Kansas for life. Yes. <laughs> and just just get the Dodd father. Um you know, tanning out, just got the, the Dodd father out of the, the beach big 36 house. inch gold chain on. Yeah. Just... <laughs> well, I'll find, I'll find a picture of Dennis and we'll put together an album cover. Dodd father, Kansas for life. <laughs> Coming up on the other side, the NFL draft combine is getting underway this weekend in Indianapolis. My colleagues here, Tom Fernelli, Danny Cannell offer a lot of insight on the NFL draft process. We'll ask them, what are you looking forward to and more next the madness doesn't just happen. Yo, get ready! And although it's marked on our calendars each year, it's built by moments of mayhem before. And the crowd goes crazy! And it begins to bubble long before it bursts. Sure, madness and marks may go hand in hand, but it starts right here. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast before we get involved in uh, some NFL draft combine inf talk. Uh, let's get spicy. So Steven jumped in an hour before the show started because he wants to know how many losses would Alabama have to have to fire their new head coach? <laughs> not, a great what, question. not what do you think is reasonable <laughs> where the administration and boosters would actually consider it? In year one, six. Is what you would consider or the fans? I don't care about the fans. He's asking about what Alabama have to. So I'm 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 doing it from the administration. Um, I would say six. Man, I would say five. It always depends on like who you lost to, how did it look when you lost, like circumstances. But I would say five or six. That if you're Bama, you'd have to look at it and be like, uh oh, did we make a mistake? Six and six is not fireable, in my opinion. I don't think the administration would move on that because that is admitting right away that you are not that firing after year one is admitting you were wrong. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think that administrators in, in college sports at the highest level are so um, determined to make their decision look correct that they would be willing to move. So I think 
I think not making a bowl game. I think five and seven is what it would have to be. I think if if they are playing in a bowl game, then I think that we're not talking about it. Though next year two hot seat would certainly be on. <laughs> what what bowl are they playing in though? It's six and six. That would be the an Birmingham embarrassment bowl. for them. They're in where Shreveport in the independent opt outs bowl. galore. Independence Bowl was where Nick Saban's first Alabama year finished. That's right. That's where dynasties start. So, hey, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and that would, be the line, of the F- <laughs> that would be the line repeated by Greg Byrne and everybody else that was trying to defend the move would be like, hey, Nick Saban started off the same way. Let's not panic, everybody. But what, at what point do you think the, it's seven and five? If they're eight and four, are the fans upset? Or is it seven and five that the fans are calling for firing? I would think fans will be upset with anything just because they're so used to being Alabama. And I mean, we saw like when, when they would lose twice Alabama, you'd hear like Nick Saban's got to go Paul just because they were going 10 and two. So yeah, they'll be mad. But I also, it's one of those things where we don't really know because it's been a very long time since we've seen Alabama fans in this situation. They're kind of, will they be more, you know, reasonable understanding the situation or will they just be you know as commonly referred to as gumps we'll find out so it the answer is um seven and five is when they start to get angry because seven and five likely means you are 500 against your sec schedule and you have lost at wisconsin you know their non-conference schedule is uh western kentucky south florida at wisconsin and mercer so the math to get to uh, seven and five means you have to lose one of those, or you've got a losing record in SEC play. And those you say like who you are, who you lose to. If Alabama is a middle of the road four and four in SEC play, then that's that that's going to get fans angry. South Florida almost beat them this past year. Hey, mm-hmm. that was Just saying. Hey, Just saying. There was some weird stuff going on there was. on that team. I, I, do not, I do not anticipate um, an active protest of by the own roster. <laughs> but I will say this, and I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying that South Florida offense, which is just, you know, the the, the same Tennessee, the, the Bryles offense, put stress on your secondary and all that kind of stuff. Alabama secondary in 2024 will not be as good as Alabama secondary in 2023. So can't completely rule it out. In Did Brian you? Denny Stadium? Yeah. I'm saying you Did can't you? completely rule it out. I think you can rule it. You better be able to rule it out or else they're in trouble. I Did mean, if you? Alabama if Alabama goes uh if Alabama is hosting Georgia with a one and two record with losses to South Ooh. Florida and Wisconsin. <laughs> well, they got problems. Yeah. Yeah. And then Georgia's the biggest one of all. Did you see Dallas Turner's comments from the combine yesterday about he saw the end of Nick Saban's era? Like he saw he noticed a big difference. That when he was a freshman, Saban was more controlled, like more involved, and that he like let go and he was more joking around and he let the players take over more. I thought that was interesting coming from inside the program. Uh, I saw the headline. I didn't hear the quotes. Um, I generally agree with that. Didn't Mm -hmm. we say like, hey, guys, doesn't it seem like Nick is laughing a lot more, smiling a lot more, taking things in stride? we saw it, you know, I, we, we didn't have Dallas Turner's access, right? He's got that good perspective too, of what it was like when he showed up versus what it was like this past season. Speaking of the NFL draft combine, um, all the activities get underway here on Thursday. They will run through the weekend. Tom, I know it's one of your favorite events of the year. Uh, you and Danny both covered the NFL draft for CBS sports on multiple platforms. So, so what are you looking for, Tom, um, from, from the draft combine? Just either it could be players, it could be narratives. Like, What, what are some of the things that uh, you're really fired up about this weekend? Uh, I'm, I'll enjoy all of it. I, there's certain aspects. Like the one thing with the quarterbacks that kind of stinks, but you expect it every year is like Caleb's not throwing, Drake May's not throwing, Jaden Daniels not throwing. And it makes sense because they have nothing to gain by doing so. If you, if you look around, they're the top three quarterbacks on most people's boards. You look at the mocks. Almost all three of them are going in the top 10, if not the first three picks in a lot of them. So they've only got, you know, they can only hurt their status by making a few bad throws and situations that don't matter. So, but I do think one of those, it's, 
the combine to me is fun because it's you get to see players in an element where there's a lot of pressure on them, but it's not really, I don't know, like that's the word I'm looking for. It's not really replicable in game action. You're just kind of finding out who they are as athletes. You're not finding out who they are as football players. I think that's mm. probably the best way to put it. But I do think you will see J.J. McCarthy's stock rise because I think that once people see what J.J. McCarthy can do with a football, they'll be like, oh, Michigan just didn't have him throw because they didn't need to because they could just maul you to death with their run game. So I, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I'm looking forward to watching the offensive lineman just because I always look forward to watching the offensive lineman. And, and speaking of Michigan, somebody I think that didn't get a ton of attention that the more I've watched McCarthy tape, he kind of stands out is Keegan, their left guard, who I thought against both Washington and Alabama was the best offensive lineman on the team in those two games. I think he's somebody who you could see his stock rise. And then another one is you haven't heard a lot about the defensive tackles in this class. Like you've seen Byron Murphy and Johnny Newton get projected as first rounders in a lot of mocks, but that's typically it. Like Tavondre Sweat is not seen as a first round pick. And other guys, I think somebody who isn't mentioned a lot who could really, really boost their stock, Rucororo is Clemson. we yeah we know who he is the Clemson defensive tackle but he's not somebody you see in a lot of mocks as being a first round pick hell I don't even know if people have him second or third I think his stock can really improve because he's somebody who I think is going to flourish in a setting like this and then two players I really want to see and I doubt one of them ends up running but I kind of want him to I'll start with Chop Robinson is my number one edge rusher in this class I don't think it's a great edge rushing class I think once you get Chop Robinson in the combine setting, his stock is going to absolutely skyrocket because he doesn't have the great production at Penn State as far as sacks. But Penn State used him in a lot of different ways, and athletically he is very, very special. And I think if you wanted to just make him a pure pass rusher, he'd be very good at it. If you wanted to use him as a Swiss Army knife, he'd be very good at it. But what I really want to see, I want to see Malik Neighbors run the 40 because I can't – let's see – Malik Neighbors has a uh, SYP speed. And that stands for something I can't stand here. We'll just say poop your pants speed. And <laughs> I, I want to see him in the 40 because I do think he could be like 4-2-ish, if not below. So that will be really interesting to see for me. I'm trying to think. Do the quarterbacks, do they throw in alphabetic order? Is that how they're numbered? Yes. So if I'm J.J. McCarthy... I might switch my name so I'm further. I might go by like your middle name so you're further away from Joe Milton. Because, <laughs> I mean, because if he has to go right before that bazooka comes out, it's going to make it look like he's got a little pea shooter. I'm telling you, that guy, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what Milton does. Like if the, yeah. if the scouts, wow, if he's able to impress or if he's like throwing it all over and it's not hitting any receivers and it's just, you know, spraying it all over the yard. But I'm with you. I think J.J. McCarthy has the most to gain because there's an absence of the top three guys. Like, he has a massive opportunity. And I'll be honest, I'm bummed that the top three aren't aren't throwing because I do think that Drake May and Jaden Daniels do have something to play for. It's who's better. Like, who's mm-hmm. going to go Who's gonna go f- ahead of you? And I would say even more so Drake May. Like, I'm surprised he's not throwing because Jaden Daniels, Heisman Trophy winner, he can go say, go look at the tape. Like the inconsistency Drake May showed, I do think is valid criticism, even with the lack of offensive line and lack of weapons around him. I think he could erase some of those doubts and criticisms by going and tearing it up. The reason quarterbacks don't throw, though, it's become the standard is like to, in 50 throws, you want to complete 50 of, or 48 of them. You know, like in the order to do that, you need to know your receivers, your guys a very scripted routine workout where you're throwing, you know, exactly. I'm going to throw three quick outs, you know, three deep outs. I'm going to hit a deep in like, and then the poke, excuse me, post, then a fade. Like they know every single route. It's so scripted. But remember last year, CJ Stroud, like really cemented his position. And I thought he made himself a lot of money because there was as easy as it is to look now and be like, Oh yeah, duh. He was the second overall pick and he had the rookie of the year. There were concerns about CJ coming out. It was like, hey, can he take the hits? And thank goodness he had the game against Georgia, but I thought he solidified his status. I remember, I don't know who it was, but it was like that might have been the best throwing performance we've ever seen. And he left unequivocally no doubt. And I think Drake Mayer or Jaden Daniels could have really cemented themselves as the two if they would have thrown. And I wonder if some of it is between these two. 
Oh, he didn't. He's not throwing. I'm not going to throw. You know. Mm-hmm. You know. Which I do I think love. going going back to what you said, I I push back a little bit. I mean, Jake May was inconsistent. I'm not pushing back against that, but I think Jaden Daniels was more inconsistent than May. I just mm-hmm. think that Jaden's big plays were huge. It's like when when you watch LSU tape, it is remarkable. Like I got, I sent you guys that screenshot from yesterday. I was yeah. watching the Florida game, and he's got three open receivers, and he's not under any pressure, and he takes off running. And he's got like one of them is Malik Neighbors in the middle of the field between without a Florida Gator within ten yards of him, and it's like why aren't you throwing that pass? But more than that, like Jaden misses a lot of like layups, and he misses them like by you know feet, not not inches. So. I think when he hits, he's just got such a boom or bust. And I think, and again, I voted for him for the Heisman. So it's not like I thought he had a bad year. It's just, I do think that when you're looking at him as an NFL prospect, all these guys, when you watch them, they miss throws. It's like, there, there's no perfect player out there. It's not everybody that's making perfect throws. And it's like, you nitpick them to death over it. It's just, I felt like Jaden missed a lot more easy throws than anybody else that I've seen so far that I've been watching. So that'll be interesting. But this is going off subject here a little bit. Question for you, Danny. I have noticed when I'm watching these guys, it's not to a man, but almost almost all of them are much better on the touch deep throws, but on anything where they really have to drive the ball, the accuracy completely drops off like pretty noticeably. Is that mm-hmm. is that possibly a reflection of like the seven on seven kind of thing where you're just you're tossing all these little fades and stuff against air and it's just you get really good at it but anytime you got to squeeze a ball in there these guys just don't have the experience yes i think it's that i think it's also the lack of fundamentals which have kind of been embraced by the younger generation of quarterbacks like watching patrick mahomes i think we even talked about that like like this is the the reason that i think caleb williams is getting compared to patrick mahomes is the style of play is very similar like the footwork is out the window uh, our buddy Raja Bell used to work with us at CBS uh, Sports HQ as a son who's awesome. And I was watching some tape of his son. He sent me some film to break down. And you can see the way he's training is more off balance, you know, throwing off the wrong foot, throwing on the run. Very rarely do you take five steps, seven steps, hitch, and set your feet firm and rip it, you know, on a line where, and you just don't see quarterbacks do that anymore. And so I do think the lack of just making those throws, you know, repetition is what breeds the inaccuracy, you know, because a lot of those, when you like the harder you try to throw it, your feet, if they're not balanced or you overstride or you understride or whatever your tendency is to do, you're going to be more inaccurate. And if you're not doing it a whole lot, then yeah, you're. That, I think it's a great point. Because it's not the flick. The flick right. is the touch. Mm-hmm. And yeah. You can do that with the flick is all the rage right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know? But when you need to drive, you've got to have like feet that are planted so you can throw through your whole hips and everything. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like incredible. I'll be watching the tape and it'll be a 40 yard throw from like the far hash to the sideline where the receiver's got no room to the outside. And it's just perfectly placed in a bucket like 90% of the time. But like a 10 yard slant over the middle, and he's missing by 15 feet, you know. And it's like, how does that happen repeatedly? Yeah. Yeah. I always think the interesting thing about the combine, Danny, back to what you were saying in terms of like knowing exactly what you are going to do, it's uh, are, are you smart or are you good at taking a test? Right. right. Like, I, that's, I'm always sort of like a hypersensitive to that, not to overreact one way where I'm thinking that one guy's going to be awesome based on how they perform over the weekend in Indianapolis when I'm sure they've got a camp that's done everything to make sure that they're going to get all the right grades. And then at the same time, I'm also not going to bail on someone who on tape has been very excellent at what they do because they just fell short because I it's it's just a, it's always hard for me. I always come out of the combine interested to hear what NFL people have to say about these guys because while there are so many examples of why your little your octagon score can like show how you're excellent at all these different things based on how you test, I I'm always kind of a tape guy myself. Just you should, always should be. That should mm-hmm. be the number one priority. Is what did you do in a real football game? <laughs> Yeah. Like, I don't care what you do against there. Like the Zach Wilson, that was one that drove me nuts. Remember his pro day? Yes. He made like, he made all throw. the throws. <laughs> yeah. It was like the reverse out, throw back across your body. Tape. And I mean, if you could go back and get some of the evaluators comments, it's like, that might be the best throw I've ever seen in the history of mankind. And it's like, 
So, like, how many of those did he make at BYU? And sure enough, like, he was the ultimate example of, like, a workout warrior. Uh, Lige and I were doing a, a thing on Spotlight the other day. It was like, what? How much are you interested in the combine? And we put it, like, at a 3 out of 10. Because it's, like, it's fun. And I get it from the fan. Like, I'll watch. Like, it's fun to watch the 40s. It's fun to watch and see how far they can throw it. But from an evaluation standpoint, it should be, like, a 3. It's just kind of confirmation. That's why... There's like there's a growing list of head coaches who aren't even going. Hey, you know, but like, the Washington owner is. They shows how dedicated he is to the process. Yeah, he Honestly, like TV I, time. He's still first year. <laughs> I think the most valuable aspect of the combine for me is the linemen and the linebackers. Just to see, because you know when you put them through some of those drills, you see how well they can move and change speed. Mm-hmm. And while like a defensive tackle is not probably going to have to make that kind of move in a game. Knowing that he can do it just gives you an idea of how athletic he is, which kind of tells you what you're getting. So, you know what the most valuable to me would be? The one that we don't get. I would love if you could pay a subscription fee to get access to the meetings, mm-hmm. the closed oh. door meetings. I would watch that. And I do think, like, and you guys know this, I think I've told you guys this we're here. Like, there are two quarterbacks that I completely changed my mind on after I spent 10 to 15 minutes interviewing them was Justin Herbert when he was coming out of Oregon. There was always shy. He's not a good leader. Met him, did an interview with him, and was like, oh, he's just kind of quiet. But he had like a quiet confidence about him. The other one was C.J. Stroud last year. I was very much like I mentioned, like, I don't know if he can do it. He didn't rise under pressure against Michigan. Spent 10, 15 minutes with him. And he wasn't that great with media. But like he kind of opened up, and it was a little bit just more personable. And I saw it in a different way. I was like, oh, this guy can command a locker room. Like he's got it, and like totally changed my complexion. So, um, I I look at it, and I wish we could get those interviews because I do think those you would glean a lot of information. I think that's what the coaches do too. Like they that first impression matters. I would love to see the Bears interviews because Matt Eberflus challenges them all to a game of darts or a game of you know like putting, and he yeah. lets them pick which one you want to do. And he just because he just wants to see you know how, how competitive you- they are and how they handle. Yeah. Um, I like I that. So I was, um, I was on right after Danny on Tuesday and Tom, uh, the icebreaker to start the one o'clock hour was, you know, how, how many reps could you get up and, <laughs> and, and Brady, Brady was claiming he could still hit his combine numbers <laughs> I, pretty much. And if you remember, so he was right. Cause he re- Jay Cutler, because I didn't do the 225. Like, you didn't have to as a quarterback. I didn't do anything. I threw. That was it. I didn't want to run. I was like, I'm a quarterback. Look at this talent. Come on. (laughs) Exactly. I was like, I'll throw the ball. That's what I do on the field. I didn't want to run a 40 because they are notoriously slow with their watches. By the way, shout out Mike Long Track in Tallahassee. Ran a 478. They asked me to line up and do it again. Ran a 482. And that was it. That was all she wrote. We could (laughs) average it out and go with 48. Perfect. Just wanted to be below five. Maybe when dated, but we don't have to remember that. <laughs> uh, but Brady, uh, Jay Cutler, the year before, like blew, everyone was raving about Jay Cutler because he threw up to 25. I forget. It was like 20 plus. It was a pretty big number. And I remember coming out of college. I could maybe do it like eight, maybe if on a good day. Um, so that's why I didn't do it. And Brady, Brady's a big dude. Like if yes, you see Brady in person, like he and can Brady's work, like he can thing. move some weight. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. The, 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 uh, the total was, the question was, what would be our total between Jeremy St. Louis, Chris Hassel, Brady, and me? How many 225s could we, how many reps could we do? And we put it at 40, and they were they were like, no way could we do that. And Brady's like, yeah, I'll give you 20. I was like, all right. I was like, I because I did get I some old say, man going, strength I, later. I'm going Brady, Danny, Jeremy, and then I'm putting Hassel in last as a <laughs> No, listen, like Jeremy's no got joke. that pliable. Like Jeremy's out, in shape. Yeah. 225 getting it. Like, if you don't work out, like, it's, it can be, it can yes. be tough to get up. And I, I also, if, could he period, get it once? It can be tough to get up, like, at all. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I with, I with a surge of momentum might be able to give you a couple, but I don't know if I could give you more than three. If yeah. I got one up right now, I'd be thrilled. I would just put the bar <laughs> back down and just, like, thank you. Thank you. I've, I don't think I've put more than 200 on a bar since I was 25. Right. Yeah, I was I was waiting I was waiting to do uh the B block talk about college basketball and I was looking I was like uh Brady and Danny got to get y'all to 35 or 36 if you're going to hit 40. <laughs> once once uh, you hit this age it's about maintaining not building. I'm not trying to be exactly. 225. 
100%. Coming up on the other side, diving into the big old bag of mail with a look at some quarterbacks that might be flying a little under the radar and more from the Cover 3 tailgate next. We give thanks to the athletes who took big risks, who beat the odds despite being our balls because of their skin. But to change the status quo, you have to be willing. This is the month we remember. But more importantly, we dream of something bigger. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, Daniel jumped in the tailgate, cracked one early, and wants to know, can you rank Mac coaches based solely on vibes? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I'm only going to do a five. Uh, number one, Chuck Martin. Just, yes. That's, I think that's an unquestioned number one. Uh, number two... I'm going Jim Thomas, McElwain. No, I'm going Thomas Hammock. Um, I don't know. If, yeah. No, no, no. Exactly. Here's the argument for Hammock. The argument for Hammock is that uh, Northern Illinois is a vibes team. Mm -hmm. The numbers do not say Northern Illinois should win as many games as Northern Illinois wins. Winning at the margins, vibes, baby. Thomas mm -hmm. Hammock definitely deserves a top five spot. Yeah, I would put Hammock up the five in the top five. Uh, I guess Jim McElwain's top five, but I would I'd go Mike New, mm -hmm. and then God, who'd my fifth beat? Not after last year. Chris Creighton normally, but I just feel like he was he was grumpy as hell last year, and it showed on the team. Uh, Kenny Burns. Wow, no love for Wagon. I would have I would have Tim Albin in there. He, not, he Tim was Albin's not a vibes guy to me though. He's just he took coach. over. Remember, he got handed that job like two months before the season started, and he he's been able to at least keep the wheels rolling in the right direction. Um, yeah, but he's, he's he's lost he's lost his boy. Joe Moorhead? No, Joe's, Joe's vibes aren't great right now. That's true. Oh, yeah, vibes right now is also different than <laughs> are you a vibes guy. Danny, you got any thoughts on Mac vibes? <laughs> I don't know. I'm scrambling to look at all the Mac coaches to make sure I had them all included. I mean, these offseason, trying to keep track of who's still there, who's not. Um, I think you guys nailed it. I would say Albin, though. I've, I've interviewed him. He's pretty good in. He's pretty good vibes. Yeah. I've, okay. Yeah. Uh, anytime that you're you're handed a difficult situation as a head coach and you navigate it, you have to have good vibes to be able to do that. So I'm, I'll, I'll throw him in there as well. And thank you to Daniel for jumping in early, almost an hour and a half before we got started getting the conversation going in the tailgate. Uh, we absolutely I do would say, love to see it. I would say Jason Candle has the strongest get me the hell out of here vibe. Yeah, I, that's so funny. The most successful coach in the MAC we did not mention. Right. Nobody yeah. mentioned Jason Candle. Uh, that's just not not the vibes that uh, that I'm looking for. All right, in the big old bag of mail, where if you leave us five star review and in that review put your question, we'll tackle it. We'll throw it in the big old bag of mail. Tackle it in a future mailbag episode. This one comes from uh, Apple Podcast user named Goaded Reviewer. Congratulations! But you have nice uh, W Pod W analysis and breakdowns that other football podcasts lack. Question, what are some quarterbacks that no one is talking about that could surprise fans next year or even be in the Heisman conversation? Whoa, whoa. I'll start. Connor Wegman and Cade Klubnick. So I'm interested because I was thinking more off the radar, but he said could surprise and be in the Heisman. Yeah, um, I, we've talked about how they're the top group of quarterbacks doesn't have, you know, super, superstars. Right. I, I felt like we could cast a wider net and just be like a quarterbacks who could surprise in general because literally outside of four quarterbacks, anyone else would be a surprise for most fans just because there's mm -hmm. not that many household names right now. Um, well, These aren't really off the radar radar, but Kyron Jones at Virginia Tech is awesome. I love him. He's going to be very fun. Depending on how good that team is, he'll – He'll develop buzz. Uh, KJ Jefferson at UCF is going to be really interesting because I, we know who KJ is at this point and we know what his strengths are. And I think those strengths line up perfectly for what Gus Malzahn usually asks his quarterbacks to do. And I think in a Big 12 that's kind of wide open, he could be a very impactful player. Uh, Aiden Childs at Michigan State, the transfer from Oregon State, who mm -hmm. came with Jonathan Smith. I think he is a very talented player. I think he's going to win that starting job, and I think he could be pretty good. 
And then shout out to Bill Connolly for this one. Preston Stone at SMU. Because when you look, he he wrote about him in a column earlier this week. Last year, there were a few quarterbacks who were really notorious for taking deep shots and just, you know, like, and uh, it was uh, Jaden Daniels and uh, God, oh, Penix. And it was just, you know, like with the air yards per attempt, you know, who was right there with them statistically? Preston Stone, just absolutely ripping the ball down the field. He's a very high variance player, but the way that that offense runs, Preston Stone, and now that they'll be ACC has a chance to garner some traction. I am not nearly as high on Cade Klubnick as our go-to reviewer, although I do like the Connor Wegman suggestion. Yeah, especially Colin Klein uh, taking over that offense, which we talked about the other day. I had a few. Uh, Avery Johnson, Kansas State. Uh, Will Howard, maybe one of the reasons he left. I mean, obviously, you're going to Ohio State. got a pretty good opportunity there. Again, Colin Klein leaving to wonder the impact it has. But talking to uh, their coaching staff, I mean, they – they love the athleticism, what they see out of him. Mm -hmm. So he could uh, he could really uh, shake things up. I had Garrett Nussmeyer. Remember last year, I think it was Stanford Steve on the set of College Game Day said he heard that they were thinking about starting Garrett Nussmeyer over Jaden Daniels. Remember that? And mm -hmm. I, my boy Stanford Steve, like he's my guy. And I was like, where did that come from? But I don't think he, I think there were rumblings maybe that they liked Garrett Nussmeyer. Like, and that was kind of what he was getting at. And that was before Jaden Daniels' season kind of took off. And he, like, from that moment, it was almost like the start of his Heisman campaign. But I think he could really impress. Um, I also had some – oh, Jackson Arnold, Oklahoma. Mm. Uh, I'm more worried about Oklahoma, the team, than I am about Jackson Arnold. But uh, from everything talent-wise, uh, I've heard it's supposed to be spectacular. Miller Moss, USC. If we get what we saw in the bolt – but here's the thing, Tom. Here's the thing. Is it – Lincoln Riley, don't we almost just plug in a quarterback and it's going to yeah. work? You know, so like, I mean, six touchdowns, six tutties in the bowl game. If they get back, you know, I will say this. The, if they get back to actually running an offense, then yeah, I think so. And I think that they were actually running an offense in that bowl game and Miller Moss took advantage of it. But because, I mean, too much of last year, I think, was just let Caleb go be Caleb and do Caleb stuff. Um, Yeah, so I, I, I won't push back too much on that. I just, I don't, I'm not that high on but he is in Lincoln Riley's offense, and he'll put up numbers. We talked about USF. I saw him in person at the Boca Bowl, Byron, Byron Brown. Brown. Mm -hmm. He was pretty special last year. You look at his numbers, and then that game, he like you know, you kind of see the ball, and he the ball jumps off his hand. Uh, he's pretty athletic. I think year two for Alex Golesh, you could see. I mean, they were, I mean, going from one wins to what was it, eight, seven, eight to finish. I mean, that's one of that's a pretty impressive turnaround. I think he's a big reason why. And then I had uh, Brennan Soresby, uh, Indiana going to Cincinnati, mm -hmm. uh, flashed at Indiana a little bit uh, from whatever, you know, he didn't play that much, but he was still pretty good when he did play. And uh, Cincinnati could be a good landing spot for him. Love the uh, Avery Johnson call. There was a game where Kansas State and TCU played, and it had like a lot of Avery Johnson, and TCU had Josh Hoover. And Josh Hoover was not perfect. If I remember, he had a turnover in the game, but you could kind of see – where things would be going. Uh, Hoover expected to really take the reins there at TCU. That's one to keep an eye on. I also had Miller Moss. I also had Rocco Becht, who I've now mentioned twice in two weeks on the Cover 3 podcast, who I think is probably under the radar. He's in that category of under the radar for a lot of college football fans. But I think anybody who watched a lot of Big 12 is, was very aware of sort of him and the trajectory that he's on right now. I do wonder, though, is Sheila House leaving and the new OC coming in? I, I do have some – I need to see it with Iowa State next year. I don't know if we could just assume that it's going to look the same as it did last year. A uh, couple other names. Noah Fafita. I, to me, that's not a breakout kind of un underrated because yeah. I love him. But I think nationally, yeah, Noah Fafita can count for like this Like Noah one. Fafita, then, Cam Ward, Dylan Gabriel, Quinn Ewers, Will Howard, Jackson Dart, like those, Carson Beck, those are known commodities. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would – I don't think those are quarterbacks that would surprise anyone if they had a good season. Also, Tyler Van Dyke, That's the, your boy. The, the comeback, the return, TVD, and I Kyle McCord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thirty-five hundred <laughs> and thirty-five no, touchdowns. Yeah, gonna um, have a better year than Walker Howard. Or, yeah, Will I Howard. got somebody Will who Howard, Walker Howard. Walker I Howard got somebody. Yeah, Will Howard definitely. Uh, who's somebody who I think we would all have. If we hadn't seen him play last year, Malik Murphy at Duke. 
Like, remember oh, his spring yeah. game before, and then he didn't look great. Like, it was a little dicey, but I, but he got some experience on his belt. But I think the tools are there. It'll be interesting to see what he can do at Duke. Um, Thomas Castellanos. Yeah. So I guess he's he's sticking around, right, for Bill O'Brien? Mm -hmm. No. Oh yeah, I mean Thomas. We'll see. Got a, got another got another portal uh, window opening up here in about a month and a half. That'll be April fifteenth through the thirtieth. Uh, so something to keep an eye on. Anthony Calandria, the uh, whoopsie daisy I, king. Whoopsie daisy yeah. king. I mean, we covered three tailgate. They they know our heart. All right. In this speaking of the tailgate, uh, Doc says, how many points does Iowa's offense need to average this year to make the playoff? Didn't hear any mention of new offensive coordinator Tim Lester on the show yesterday during the assistant co coaching carousel recap. Manageable schedule plus returning a ton on defense. 25 points per game. No, don't be mean. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a reason that they chose that number. I'm going to say 32.5. 32.5 I don't think they would need to, to make the playoff to make the 12 team playoff as what I would expect to be an at large. You probably need to be a top 10 team. You know what? Like I was like 11 and one last year. If they scored 24 points per game, I understand, but I'm, I am pulling the points per game from a team that was in the new year six last year with a really good defense. That would be Missouri. Missouri averaged 32.5 points per game. They would not have been in the 14 playoff clearly but they made the new year six as what would have been an at large. They would have been a playoff team. So 32.5. Sure. Jeez. Uh, I don't, Ohio state last year at a 30.5, 30.5, 30. Yeah. Okay. I'll take 30. That's what I'm saying. You're just, just come on, chip. The landscape has changed. College basketball scoring is up. College football scoring is down. I don't think 25 is that crazy to say like, it is pretty good. I remember Ooh. there were only four teams in the big 10 that went over right yeah. last year. Illinois so, is almost one of them. Yeah. In, in terms of scoring offense, the lowest scoring average of a team with a high finish would have been, I guess, Oklahoma State maybe at 29.6, Ohio State at 30.5. Ohio State having one of the lowest scoring averages of top teams is obviously one of the reasons why we've got Louisville. so much over. Louisville playoff team, if it was 12 this past year, it was 30.5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess 30, 30 points per game. I don't think 25 is going to cut it. I mean, if you get 28, you're a Heisman winner and your coach could be on the cover of uh, the A sports game. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what Colorado had 28 points a game. That's right. Is on the cover? Have they announced that? No, no, I'm saying oh. prime. Oh, the head coach goes four and eight could be on the cover. It's true. There does seem to be something coming with that. Well, it, you just you feel like uh, there's feel a, there's got to be yeah I think there's something coming something brewing. Okay, I'm more worried about the uh, endangered species of the fullback at Iowa than anything. Tim Lester runs a lot of shotgun in his offenses. I don't know. We'll see what Kirk allows him to do, but I don't know if Tim Lester's running the same offense at Iowa that he was running at Western. Bye bye fullback. Um, Parker in the tailgate says who are some dark horses for the G five playoff. But if we want to get more specific, Sam on a similar note says, what are your thoughts on Boise state bringing back Dirk cutter as offensive coordinator? As a Boise state fan, my expectations are really high. Where do they sit among the favorites to make the group of five spots? Did you guys read? I forget where I, I couldn't, I think it was an official, like a legit website. And I want to say they interviewed 18 offensive coordinator prospects and they ended up like going back to Dirk Cutter and saying, you want to be the guy? Because remember, he was there. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So like, I, that's not the best indictment of it. But he was there as like an analyst, right? Because this is a hire yeah. because Bush Hamden left to... Wait, where did he just go? We were talking about it. He went to become Kentucky's OC. Kentucky. Run the football. That you know, That's something run that you were... Ball. Yeah, run the dang ball. You felt like that was going to be a good style fit. Um, so they're making the hire because they lost an offensive coordinator. Dirk Cutter's going to, you're going to be able to give them what, the hometown discount or whatever? Like you're probably going to be able to save a little bit of money there. 
They do have former five-star prospect Malachi Nelson, the transfer mm-hmm. from USC. Right. So if you want to look for uh, you know, former blue chip landing somewhere else. I mean, we were all surprised when Nelson ends up going to Boise state, you know, what does that say about the experience at USC? What did those coaches tell other coaches? Uh, his, he's got a real reclamation project there in Nelson, but if all the same tools that made him a five-star prospect are able to click. Yeah. I mean, Boise state is going to have their hands full with UNLV Boise state. It's gonna well, Oregon's gonna have their, gonna have their hands full with Oregon week two. Oh well, yeah. I was I was just trying to think like, to be the group of five spot, you need to be the conference champion. So whether right. we're talking about um, Boise State in the Mountain West or App State in the Sun Belt or um, Tulane in the American, the conversation has to start with like, are you distance wise like are, are you ahead of most of the conference? I, it will be tough winning the Mountain West, but if they do. I, yeah, I would say that they've got a decent shot to be able to make that 12 seed. Maybe. Going back to the question, though, about Dirk Cutter, when was the last time anybody was excited about Dirk Cutter? I mean, I'm not. What? Yeah, I'm, it's kinda, like. Don't I'm say not I'm not to, mean to be mean, but that was kind of mean. <laughs> no, I'm not saying he's a bad coach. I'm just saying, when was the last time, like, Dirk Cutter's star was seen as on the rise? Like, when he was the OC at Atlanta, like, a decade ago? And then he ended up going to Tampa, got the head coaching job. And then after that, he went back to Atlanta as the OC again, the return to come back and restore the glory. And it didn't go well. And then he's been kind of like an analyst at Boise State since. So I don't know. It could work. It might not work. It's just the idea that I'm super excited about Dirk Cutter coming back. It's just, okay, cool. Oh, yeah. And Liberty also is probably your like the the front runner just because – New Mexico State is going to be downgraded a little bit. Jacksonville State might end up being uh, difficult to get by. Um, we'll we'll see there. But Liberty is your favorite in Conference USA, and they've got a schedule where they can go twelve and zero again. If they do that, you're just going to up moving up in the rankings. That's that's going to be an interesting debate though, because I think they need to schedule a Power Five opponent just to have one on the resume, and they don't. You know, oh, even to like if Boise State, State does beat Oregon. Well, then all of a sudden, they're a lock. The game, <laughs> I mean, the game changed at that point. Yeah. It's in Eugene, though. I mean, that's I, but I think it's one of those games where I would hope if they even keep it close, if it's a touchdown and they're in Eugene and they keep it close, I would hope that's one of those we reward you for scheduling type of games. That'll be a that'll be a big time debate when it comes to the very end. Because look, I don't think that college football fans were given like the full say it with your chest passion when we're talking about who's going to go to the cotton bowl or the peach bowl for a new year six bid. But when it's a spot in the playoff, there's going to be a lot more interest in making sure that whoever they feel is the most deserving uh, ends up getting there. We will be back on Monday where we will be recapping some of the things, uh, big takeaways from the NFL draft combine. Tom, do you want to run back the golden dumbbells, Tom? Golden Dumbbell Awards? Sure. Okay. Long time, <laughs> listen, Tom loves the combine. Barton loved the combine. And one to I forgot which combine it was. It was maybe like 2018, 2019. They came back with notebook. Been a while. Yeah. And we were doing superlatives. So yeah, we'll bring back the Golden <laughs> Dumbbell Awards for uh some of the outstanding superlatives coming out of the NFL draft combine and so much more. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernell. You can follow him at Danny Cannell. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Rip Barton. Got it.